welcome. Y'all look absolutely amazing this morning. Hey, the Word of God says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We're here, we are alive, and we have breath in our lungs. So come on, let's stand to our feet, and let's sing this out together. I praise in the valley. It goes like this. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. Hey. I'll praise when I'm short, and praise when I'm down. Come on, let's put our hands together. I'll praise when I'm numbered, and praise when surrounded. As long as I'm breathing, as long as I'm breathing, I got a reason to praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Hey, hey. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. I'll praise when I feel it. I praise when I feel it. And praise when I don't. Praise is a weapon, it's more than a sound. Hey, my praise is the shot that brings Jericho down. And as long as I'm breathing, as long as I'm breathing, I got a reason to praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Hey. All thrones and dominions 
all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever if you've been forgiven if you've been forgiven and if you've been redeemed sing the song
reminding us that you're here. In moments where you might seem far, you remind us, God, that you're never too far. Thank you for everyone in this room and everyone watching at home, God, for the time of community and the time of worship that we are so blessed and privileged to have, Lord. May we never take moments like this for granted. I don't know what everyone here is walking in with. I don't know what everyone at home is walking through in this season of life. But when anxiety and depression and fear and doubt, things that are very, very evident in our culture right now, God, when they come knocking, remind us, Lord, that your word says that it's not the mountains that we get our strength from or our help from. Your word says it comes from you, God. Our help comes from the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He who never slumbers nor sleeps is the one that protects you, is the one that watches over you, is the one that provides for you. And so this morning, God, we shout out your praise in your name and utter gratitude. Remind us to fix our eyes on you, not on the anxieties and the doubts and the issues of this world, but on you. Anything that's taking us away from your presence, anything that's hindering us from you, God, we pray those things be gone. And we pray for transformation. This morning, in this room, we pray for transformation, God. This morning, in every home that is watching, we pray for transformation. We pray for encounters with you, Lord. We pray for peace with you. And we pray, Father God, that we may step out of this room when it's time, just filled your presence and anointed, transformed, just ready to witness the good news that we found in this place, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the honor, Lord. And we pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Hey, take a moment to greet your neighbor. Give them a high five and a nice hug and let them know how special they are and how good it is to see them this morning. Central. <laughs> Are you talking to people? Hey, I am Kim. I'm on staff here, and this is... My name is Ethan. I'm the college young adults pastor here at Central. A... <laughs> Ooh, he has a fan club. How lovely. 
So welcome, everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces. We're so glad you're here. But also, I'm sure there's some visitors in this room. So we want to welcome you specifically this morning. A couple ways you can connect if you want to. And that is um, new here sign in the lobby. Go check that out. We have a gift for you. We'd love to say hello. Also, we have a connect card. Behind me is a QR code. You could scan that and fill out some things so we can connect with you. And that way, we would love that. And then next week is a class called Discover Central. And that's exactly what it's about, the Discover Central, who we are, what we believe, how to connect around here. And that's a great class. So it's after both services next week, after the 9 o'clock service and after this service. Right after the service, there's food, there's treats, and it's right out the lobby. We would love for you to be a part of Discover Central next week if you are new. Yeah, and one of our most core values at Central is just the family unit. Uh, we take that very, very seriously, and we have a ton of awesome programs for the spiritual development of the entire family, uh, all ages. You know, on Sunday mornings, both services, we've got Central kids and parents in the room who drop their kids off regularly. Y'all know that is so much more than just child care on Sundays. Uh, they, they are doing such incredible work over there, um, the, and, and these kids are, are hungry to, to learn and to grow. Uh, when I was a camp counselor in high school, I had a 10-year-old ask me about transubstantiation. All right, there are adults in this room, I'd be willing to bet, don't know what transubstantiation is. These kids are so hungry, and, and you're never too, too young to learn about the Bible and, and to just fall in love with Jesus. Uh, we also have middle school going on every Sunday morning during the first service. We've got high school on Sunday night with the spectacular Spencer Olson. Uh, so all, all kinds of things going on on Sunday. And then again on Wednesday, we've got Central Kids. We've got middle school again on, on Wednesday. And then we've also got um, Hot Ones Continued. And this is for high school and parents and young adult, pretty much high school and up. Uh, if you want to just have a sit down conversation in a more conversational uh, environment about what's going on up here on stage on Sundays. Sitting down with the pastor and having a conversation uh, if you want to ask questions or learn more. And so all that is going on. We uh, Again, we've got all kinds of things for each and every age group. And hey, College Young Adults, Tuesday, Thursday, come on out. And the QR code. Yes. So Central Happenings, if you're interested in what's going on uh, as far as events are concerned, you can scan that QR code behind me or just find it on the website under events. All, all going on at Central. There we go. Great. So as we turn our attention to giving, which we do every week here, it's a part of our worship service, is at, this verse has kind of spoke out to me. Uh, for those of you, I was raised in the church, and for those of you who were raised, it's a very familiar verse, but I just want to read it to you again. It's 2 um, Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Um, I know that is familiar to so many of you, and whenever that's read, what pops out to me is God loves a cheerful giver. That's what, the, you know, that's what I remember all the time. But this week, the first part of the verse stuck out to me. Let me read it again. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. So that's a little bit of a challenge of not just check a box and I give, but each of you individually, personally, or as a family unit should decide what to give um, from, from your heart, from asking God, what shall I give? And it's not a one-time thing. Maybe a couple times a year you go through this discipline and decide what to give. I think that is so beautiful. It's what God always calls us to, not to our heart. He always calls us to that. So I think that's another great thing in giving. If giving is more then meeting a need, it's an act of worship. So we need to treat it like an act of worship. So there's three ways to give here at Central. You can do it online, which I think most of you do and how we do it. But again, that can be just like a business transaction so easily. So just kind of remember every couple times a year to check that and check your heart. Is that what God wants you to do in that way? So online, you can send a check through the mail or the kiosk out in the lobby. Uh, thank you so much for your generosity and being such a generous church. Yeah, absolutely. 
Man, it is getting hotter and hotter in our Hot One series, and just want to preview what we've got coming up in the next two weeks. Next week, we're going to be talking about sexual orientation, asking the question, are we more than who we love? And then in two weeks, in this hot season of election, we're going to be asking the question, can different votes reflect the same faith? Getting spicy. It's getting spicy. Okay, but today we are discussing, is it okay not to be okay? We're so excited to have Mike McKay. So thank you so much. Welcome to church, everybody. This is the space where we get closer to God. (laughs) One wing at a time. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to week four of Hot Ones. We're in a series with hot wings and even hotter. Week five. Uh, Week five. (laughs) Well, uh, (laughs) oh my gosh, I can't talk. Well, welcome to church, everybody. We're in week five of Hot Ones. This is the series with hot wings and even hotter uh, sermon questions. Hmm. And I'm joined with Whoa. incredible central staff around here. These guys are not as incredible. <laughs> you can tell who's had it. Um, okay, so this is how this works. So we uh, we all eat hotter wings every single week. The uh, spice gets hotter, and so does the sermon topic. Um, mm-hmm. And I think for this week, we've now passed the threshold where one of us gets a mild wing. Is that right? Yes. Yes. That's how this works. Okay. Everybody ready? Okay. Ready. Are well, ready? is that for week five. How one's week five? Oh. Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Oh it. no, I I recognize the smell. <laughs> uh uh-uh. uh. I took too big a bite. I took too big a bite. I think I got the mild one. Yes, it is. I got the mild one. Finally. I don't like the that. rest of us are all going to sit here and suffer for a moment. <laughs> Actually, what? Oh, 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 it's got it a, it's got a oh, layer. Oh, yeah, it does kick in there a little it bit. Kicks. <laughs> I was going to say the other one was hot. <laughs> it kicks. It's got a late pepper. Kind of back of the throat. Kind of. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Marcus. Yeah, Marcus. Oh, it wasn't the, that the point, one. See, the point with this know? one is I actually like the taste of it, but. After that hot one, I'm afraid of like, what happens if I take a second bite. Second sure. bite, yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, take another bite, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not about this. You know what, I think I'm out. <laughs> is that too hot for you? Have it? I mean, is she numb? So that one's getting cold caught cold. in my spit a little bit. Come on, hold on, talking All right, well, good morning to you. Welcome, welcome to our service today. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I wasn't part, you noticed I wasn't part of the panel. And uh, that's for a reason, because I think mayonnaise is the most spicy thing. Um, but yeah, I, kudos to those who can weather that storm. Hey, thank you. And it, 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 we're having a little fun with that. But the idea is that we wanted to spend this fall talking about hot topics, topics that are in our culture, that are in our world. And how do they connect to our faith? And what do we do with, uh, with different kind of th- challenges, I guess, if you will, to our faith. And you just heard a couple weeks, next couple weeks are going to be pretty interesting. We'd love for you to come and, and hear what we believe God is saying to us about that. A um, couple things. One is uh, you notice that, uh, they, that, that uh, sorry, that Kim, when she was up here and they announced that we have this, when, this Wednesday night continue hot, hot ones on Wednesdays where we we kind of gather together, we're doing it down in the NPR, and we have a chance to talk about these topics a little bit further. And we know that you're not going to be able to get all of your questions answered, and sometimes we can't cover the topic entirely the way that you might have questions around. So there is this QR code if you want to submit a question. It doesn't have to be about the topic today, but maybe you've been thinking about something um, related to challenges walking in, in a faithful way in this world and uh, send us a question. And we're going to attempt to answer as many as, those, as we can uh, over the remaining weeks. In fact, the final week, we're planning to have a panel and try to address a number of those questions as well. Well, the topic today, the question, we, we do all these, these hot ones in, in form of a question, and today's question is, is it okay to not be okay? And the answer, I looked, is yes. But we don't want you to stay there. We want to we understand it better. We want to we come to a, to a place where we can understand what the scriptures say about not being okay and what we need to do about it. And we're not okay as a society. Our culture right now has put pressure 
on people in so many different ways. In fact, the CDC reports that the incidence of mental challenges around anxiety and depression have grown dramatically. And that only about 44%, 45% of people get any kind of professional help for that. Men are particularly reluctant to get any kind of help. And students are under pressure from all sides. And a recent study that kind of looked at the, at the, the introduction of the smartphone and social media around two, 2010 to 2015, the effects of that, and it has, it has doubled the amount of anxiety, depression, and challenges that, that surround that season of life. So we're under pressure, and we're not okay. There's a lot of stress. And now I grew up, maybe like some of you, you, my generation, there wasn't a lot of attention given to emotional health or emotional well-being. I, you know, if you were struggling, you were told to just deal with it. And I'm so glad that today there's a, there's a newfound kind of appreciation, if you will, for the fact that there is help and we can get help. And the church, the church should be the place where you can come and not hide at all, that the, that the pain that you, that you carry, the, the situation that nobody might know about, this is a place which should be the safest place for you to come. And so again, I want to just say I'm so glad that you're here. And I want to say right up front something that I think is important. One is that I think some of the challenges around anxiety, depression particularly, but other, other conditions, emotional challenges and, and, ch and challenges along that line are they do have spiritual, a spiritual root. And, and sometimes, you know, we're under attack. We're, un, we're in a spiritual battle. And so we believe that there is a spiritual solution to some of those. But we also believe this, that we are human beings, human bodies, and that there is sometimes a biological kind of underpinning for some of the situations. And so we believe that the medical expertise that is out there is there because God has ordained to be a healing God, and that's one of the ways that he expresses that. Here's what we trust. We trust you because, as, as the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, but God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment. So we trust you to have wise, discerning conversations. If you need help, there's ways that you can do it, and we'd love to help spiritually, but we'd also encourage you to, to consider what it might mean for you to check it out with your, with, your, with your body, with the medical world as well. Have you ever heard the expression, this is Camelot? Do you know what that means? Well, I heard that. I, Ann and I had moved here uh, about 30 years ago. We to, came to work for the church. Ann took a job at Hope College. And one of the pastors that had been hired the year before moved across the country and came to Holland, and I said, why did, why did you take the job? Why did you take the job, not only here at this church, but also, why did you come to Holland? And he said, oh, this is Camelot. Now, here's what you should know about Camelot. Camelot is a legend. It's a fictitious city, as near as we can tell. Some people are trying to find a place for it in, in the British Isles. But Camelot was part of King Arthur's legend. It was, it was this place of just... Just everything was ideal. It was idyllic. It was peaceful. It was, it was, there was just this sense of, of joy and wonderment, and everything was perfect, if you will. And so when he said, this is Camelot, I knew what it meant because we had moved from, a, from the other side of the state, and we came here, and we thought it was very much the same way. We experienced right away this thing called West Michigan nice. You know what that is? That, that we just tend to be nice. And one of the hardest things I like to tell people I had trouble getting used to was I would say to somebody, how are you doing? And they'd say, good, you too? And they, that without taking a breath, good, you too, it always threw me a little bit. I knew they were sincere, but I, I didn't want to have to answer. I was asking them, you know. Um, I think it's all part of the way that, that, that we are wired in this community. But I can tell you, for Ann and I coming in, we at first were just so enamored of just this ideal uh, place that we found ourselves, but, but we also were coming off the hardest year of our married life, even looking back. It was a year that I had been working a really intense job. I was gone a lot. Anne was busy raising three little kids, pretty much solo parenting. So we, we knew something had to change, which, which would kind of motivate us to make a move, but we had been through a very, very hard time, very stressful. We were not connecting 
it was difficult. We, made, we came here with three little kids, and we were both now new, getting used to new jobs, and we were feeling like we've got a lot of junk in our closet, you know, both figuratively and literally, and everybody seemed so together. Just to tell you how fast-paced it was for me, I, I got two speeding tickets in Holland in the first 30 days I was here. And, and that doesn't count the warning I got for rolling through a stop sign the morning I interviewed here at the church. So it was just, we were just so wired up, so hyped up, and we, we knew things were kind of shattering behind us, but we, we, were just, we, we were just covering it as much as we could. But we soon discovered, and it was sometimes a shock to us, when people that we had, had observed or admired or watched started to go through things and it became, the truth kind of came out and we, in some sense, we're like, okay, good, we're not alone. But, but also, it was kind of a shock because people were so good, and we were too, at hiding the things that were painful and the things that were not good. And sometimes the church is a place like that where we most feel like we can't let anybody know what's really going on. And we want to change that. And I think that reputation is changing. We have a ministry here you probably heard about it, I hope you have. If you're new here, you might not have, though. It's called Celebrate Recovery. And the idea is that we have a place where, where both teens on their level can go and where adults can go. And it's a place, really, if I could summarize it, to come out of the shadows and to admit that I, don't, I can't manage my life. And I want to I reveal now to some trusted friends. And I want to just, I want to begin a journey. Now, some of it does have to do with real addiction, so that's the recovery part of it. But I love what Celebrate Recovery calls itself. It's a place for people with hurts, habits, and hang-ups to come. That, that qualifies all of us. So I, I would encourage you, and it, it, it doesn't just deal with the addiction side, but also compulsive behaviors. It's a real place for real people. And I've said this before. You're all invited to come on a Monday night. Maybe just come as an observer. You can give us a fake name if you want. But we'd love you to come and just observe the community that, that goes into action. There's, there's a meal, then there's a time of celebration, and then there's always a time of people reaching milestones, or sometimes there's a testimony. It's just, it's a wonderful time of just bringing down the masks and, and, and really kind of addressing who we are before each other and before a holy God. Now, there's more, than, more to it. it. There's groups that you can, you can come to that and deal with depression, anxiety, anger, addiction to substances, but also things like codependency, sexual addiction, and so much more, and it's completely judgment-free. It's the very thing that we want to have reflected in a community like this on every morning, Sunday mornings included. And we just want people to take a step. We want freedom for you. We want freedom for the people you care about. And we just know that sometimes the burden of what you're carrying is something that only by coming together and revealing and beginning to open up in a trusted place, you'll begin to, to heal. Ann and I moved from that original house to another house a couple years ago. And so we still have little bins and boxes. And down on our coffee table in the basement is a big bin of pictures, photographs. And we've been going through them, and you know, we're there was a time we were trying creative memories, you know, and that didn't work very long. And some of you know what that is. But uh, we, we've gone through the pictures of our, our then little tiny kids. They're all grown up now. And we also found that we have this, this bin, of, bin of kids' books. In fact, I caught Anne buying more children's books. We don't have any grandkids yet. She's just building the whole foundation for that. Uh, but we still have a bin full of plastic, big plastic Tonka trucks, which I can't wait to find and get out again. But one of the things as we I start peeling through those books and looking at them, I realized two things. One is there's, there's a common theme in a lot of the stories, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but the other one is how those stories get in, in kind of emblazoned on your, on your heads. You know, parents, what I, you know, parents know what I mean. So do you remember the Dr. Seuss alphabet book? And I can still do it. Big Q, little Q, 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 Q the quick queen of Quincy and their quacking quackaroo. You don't remember that? It, you know, when I, yeah. When I typed it into my computer, the spell check went crazy. They didn't know what quackaroo was. But the stories, the, the most fun stories, the stories that we read to our little daughter, always started with once upon a time. 
They're all fairy tales, once upon a time. And they all ended how? And they lived happily ever after. We had a book with all the fairy tales, Snow White. You know, she eats the fruit and falls asleep. Sleeping Beauty, you know, she pricks her finger and she falls asleep. Cinderella has to be home by midnight, apparently, to fall asleep. <laughs> but then, but then, who comes? Always Prince Charming comes. And he either wakes them with a kiss or he fits Cinderella with a shoe and they all marry a guy named Prince Charming. And now as I'm saying it, it sounds a little confusing. But, but then you know how these stories end and they all lived happily ever after. But by contrast, we don't always experience a happy ever, happily ever after world. One of the things that is sometimes hard for, for Christians, especially new Christians, I find, is that we have this, this, this unwritten, this unspoken belief that if I'm in Jesus' camp now, then mostly good things should happen to me. Like I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be exposed to really, really bad things anymore. And certainly, certainly not the worst things. But then life happens. And our world gets rocked. And we find out that this world isn't complete yet the way Jesus is promising that it will be. And bad things do happen to really good people. And when that world crashes in on us, it becomes really and a really important part of our faith that when we get real and we acknowledge the pain, and it's hard, but when we acknowledge that we are not okay, sometimes... That pain is temporary, but sometimes it's not. It's like a hole in your life going forward. And here's the thing. We see this a lot in the Bible. The Bible does not shy away from pain. And we see it a lot in Psalms. In fact, today we're going to be in a Psalm, a really what's considered to be the saddest Psalm in all the Psalms, and one in particular. But did you know that 40% of the Psalms are laments? They're the cry of people in pain. There's even a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations. It's not the most cheery book. And one of the reasons I think we can trust our faith is that the writers of Scripture are not afraid to talk about the hard stuff. They're not afraid to put it out there. But in all, almost all the laments, if you study them, follow a certain pattern. It usually starts with a complaint. Then it, then it moves to a petition. God, you've got to help me in this. And then usually, almost always, almost always, it ends with an expression of trust or an expression of hope or expression of praise, except for two that do not. One of them we're going to look at today, it's Psalm 88. The other one happens to be Psalm 39 if you want to get cheered up later. I'm glad, but I'm glad this psalm is in the Bible. It tells us something authentic about us, about God, and about life. It seems God has put these prayers they're for a reason, and they have been read and reread and sung and recited in Christian services and in Christian circles for thousands of years. There's a reason they're there, so we do need to pay attention to them. But this psalm was written by a person in anguish, and I think we probably all could relate to a time when we felt a sense of personal despair and anguish. Commentator Derek Kidder says, the very presence of these particular prayers in Scripture is a witness of God's understanding. God knows how men speak when they are desperate. You might know that some psalms have a little introduction to them. Psalm 88 is one that does. So if you opened it on your, on your uh, Bible app or you've got a, a Bible with you today, it says that it was written by a guy named, named Haman the Ezraite. The psalm is a song, yet it is an incredibly sad song. Some have called this the very saddest of all the Psalms. Now there's numerous mentions of this guy named Haman in the days of David and Solomon. If you go back to 1 Chronicles and 1 and 2 Kings, you'll see his name come up. Most commentators believe that this particular writer is also that person. But here's what he was noted for. He was noted for his musical ability. He was a descendant of one of the sons of Korah. You know that, that's often referred to as some of the writers of Psalms. He was known for many and exceptional sons and daughters. He had a great family. He was really blessed. He's a remarkable man. He's known for his wisdom and his service to the king. 
And the fact that he wrote these words, which we're about to read, he, of all people, a wise, talented, accomplished, and blessed man, we're going to begin to see that this reality of what life can bring is, is, is where none of us are immune to it. Charles Spurgeon, in his commentary on the Psalms, wrote this. In this psalm, Haman makes a map of his life history. He writes down all the dark places he's traveled. Now this, Spurgeon writes, is real prayer. Leaving your case before the Lord. We'll see this is real prayer because it's coming from a place of despair. So let's look at Psalm 88. We'll start with the first few verses. He starts with this, first two verses. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. Now, if you were to stop right there, you'd say, oh, this isn't going to go so bad. The first few verses make you feel maybe this is going to be a little more optimistic. He's saying, oh, Lord, you're the God who saves me. He's recognizing a God of salvation, a God who rescues, a God who saves. He's he knows that he's coming to a, a source, a, a source of strength and hope in his life. He experiences a God who delivers, but that's not the case in the rest of Psalm 88. It's going to take a, a dramatic turn. Yet he starts, and this is so important, he addresses a God who saves. He is not disconnecting from God. He's still coming to the God who saves. It turns out, that this is the only glimmer of hope or light in this entire psalm. But remember this opening, because as we get through it, he's going to pour out his anguish. But remember, he's coming to a God who saves. His heart was filled with pain, but he's not running. He's just laying it out honestly. So in these first few verses, you get this sense of this very passionate prayer, and also a constant prayer. He says, day and night, He's desperate for God to hear and answer his prayer, and he's coming diligently and repeatedly. No matter how dark his affliction, he can still talk to God about it. Verses 3 and 4, he says, I am overwhelmed with troubles, and my life draws near to death. In other words, I am definitely not okay. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. He's in agony. He's overwhelmed. And I want to just say to you today, if you came today, and this would describe you, that you are in agony, that you are in some type of anguish. Maybe it's a habit you just can't get past, or maybe it's something that's happened in your life this week, and you're just broken inside. I want to say the fact that you're here, or the fact that you're watching us online, thank you so much for participating. That's a huge step a huge leap of faith to come even when you don't feel like it's going to be anything that can help you today. It's so important to do that in our faith. Verses 3, oh, we, we just covered that. So he continues to pour out his heart to God. He says, I'm overwhelmed with troubles. My wife draws near to the pit. And then he says, I am like one without strength. Have you ever been there where you're, you're at the end of your emotional rope and you don't have any ability to do anything more about it? So verse six, verses 6 through 9, he says, You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with your waves. You have taken my closest friends. It have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. In the midst sometimes of our struggles and our pain, there's this isolating effect, this sense that my friends are moving. My friends are gone. I, they find me repulsive or they find me just not a, a, able to be hung out with. I think there's a sense of isolation and we feel confined and can't escape it. But he says, I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. He's still trying. And in verse 14, but he says, why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? And the psalm goes on and on like this. I told you it was the saddest psalm. And it doesn't end on an upbeat note. It ends, it ends just like this. But here's the concluding verse, verse 18. He says, you have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. And everybody agrees that in the original language, 
It probably ended something to this effect. It probably said, my closest friend is darkness. The very last word of the psalm is darkness. Now, a few decades ago, there was a number one song. Remember it? It starts with this line, hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk to you again. It was written by a young Jewish kid from New York City who actually would have grown up hearing the psalms. It became a number one for for the reasons that a lot of songs become memorable is because it connected with the human experience of loneliness and pain. Sometimes our questions in silence need to be heard. Silence before God like why and how come and how long and when. This is a hot one. This topic is a hot one because times of despair, if we're honest about them, have the potential to grow our character but they also have the potential to shatter our faith. I know people who have run into life circumstances, poured out to God, and nothing changed, and they walked away from their faith. And I want to encourage you that if you're on that, that, that boundary today, I want you to know that there is hope and there is promise, and we'd love the chance to talk to you. The fact that this psalm is in the Bible tells me that God wants to keep a close eye on those who relate to it. It's there as a mercy for us. You might know someone, or maybe even you are someone, whose faith is being challenged right now. Your life circumstances are such that you just have question after question after question. And maybe it's just not a temporary setback. Perhaps it's a loss that isn't going to be made right on this side of heaven. You know, being a pastor often means that we get to Unfortunately or fortunately, it feels like holy ground and we get to be on the ringside, in a ringside seat for a lot of people's journeys. Whether it relates to a marriage problem or issue, a breakup, a divorce, singleness, or maybe chronic pain or agonizing grief. Addictions that have spiraled out of control. And I'm even thinking today about things beyond our control about tragedies that the Skipper family have just experienced, thinking of a friend of mine who was so shattered because his wife told him she was leaving. I'm thinking about the pain and the hurt of betrayal. And I'm thinking about people that, are, that have lost loved ones. I lost a really dear friend in this church this year, and his wife and his family are walking through this fog of grief, this new kind of reality that they never, ever wanted, and the list goes on. I, I have a friend who heard these words, it's cancer in the last two weeks. And I think of teens and students who are facing pressure on so many sides. We need to be a praying community that, that just acknowledges that there's people in desperate need of relief and hope. Now, any of these categories, if they describe you, you can say, I know without any hesitation, I'm not okay. But I'm, and I'm grateful that we have a place like this for you to come. You know, I was thinking about the worship time we have, and I've been there with you. There's been weeks where I've sat on the front row or somewhere in this audience, and I can't even say the words because we're dealing with such issues in our, in our life with maybe our kid situation or something going on, and I just feel the weight. And all I can do is read the words, but I can hear you singing. And I can, I can just for a moment be reminded that, that maybe there is something hopeful in this. There might be a temporary setback, but it might be a hole that that isn't going to be filled on this side of heaven. One day, Jesus promises that he is going to come and make all things new, but, but right now you're suffering in that loss period. So I'm grateful for us. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the way that you care for and reach out to people. And I want to just make three observations about Psalm 88. And, and I just just to kind of follow along with what we can learn from Haman in this. First of all, acknowledge the pain. Acknowledge the pain, but stay with God. Remember those first verses that he said, and he says it over again, where he says, I have come before you. I continue to come before you. He has not given up. He has not turned away. Lament is a valid spiritual practice. You're allowed to lament. A lament is not a lack of faith. It is a raw and honest expression of faith because you're bringing your brokenness to God. Even when you're not getting answers, Psalm 88 reminds us that it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to take our frustrations and our doubts and our pain to God just as we are. There's a story of a guy in the Bible who's in the 
suffering hall of fame, some, some place that none of us want to be, a man who lost everything, a man named Job. And that story, too, is there for a reason. His story opens with Satan saying in effect to God about Job, Job doesn't love you. He's loving himself because of all the stuff you've done for him, and he's using you. Take away everything in his life. Take away his family, his fortune, his health, and see what happens. He will curse you. The book in Job was intended for every one of us to read. Satan is saying that same thing about us, that we, as long as God is doing good things for us, we'll stay with him. Do we really love God for himself? Question. Do we really love God for himself? Is Satan right about you and me? The honest answer is to some degree, yeah. I mean, at least, at least we start out that way. We go to God because we want something. If we stay in that state, we'll be up and down depending on our circumstances. Now Job, the story of Job, he is another man in anguish. He loses everything. He then cries out to God. He doesn't hold back. And yet at the end, God says this, Job has honored me because Job did the same thing Haman did. He stayed with God. He didn't complain. He didn't go to God and say in anger. He, he just kept coming to God. He kept coming to God. It's because Job kept addressing God himself. He didn't complain to his friends. All, and he didn't clam up and wallow in self-pity. He was angry, but he was complaining to God. He never turned away from God. He stayed with him. And it's the same in Psalm 88. When he's saying, Job was saying the same thing, that darkness is my only friend. Now, even when you feel, you, you feel that God is not there, when you continue to pray, when you continue to get yourself out of bed and come to a place like this on a Sunday morning, when you continue to do a small act of mercy for someone else, maybe you can barely do something like that, that turns you into a person of character. That turns you into a person who is, is defying the spiritual energy that can be aligned against us. Psalm 88 tells us that God identifies with those who sometimes face darkness and confusion about God's goodness. Michael Wilcock writes this, this darkness can happen to a believer, the psalm says. It doesn't mean you're lost. The darkness can happen to someone who does not deserve it. After all, it happened to Jesus. This doesn't mean that you have strayed. This darkness can happen at any time as long as the world lasts because only in the next world will this be done away with. The darkness can happen without you knowing why, but there are answers. There is a purpose, and eventually you will know it. The very first step in any recovery is to acknowledge the pain. Remember that courage is not the absence of fear, it's to move forward in the face of fear. And I'm wondering if you need to be challenged in a gentle way to take a step, a courageous step in your recovery. Does this season demand perseverance from you? Do you need to keep praying? Does it ask for you to continue coming to God even though it's been silent? For some of you, you need to write down a lament. As I said earlier, it is a, it's a valid spiritual practice. In our sermon, we have a, a thing called sermon questions. If you go online and look at the sermon questions for this week, on the online version, we have some links that'll kind of talk you through, walk you through how to prepare a lament. It's a very powerful experience. However you do it, you need to be free to acknowledge the pain and our prayer for you and our hope for you is that you'll stay with God, our only source of hope. Second thing, challenge your view of the darkness. Darkness comes, but challenge your view of it. Paul seemed to think that we, Paul can be annoying sometimes, to be honest, but Paul seemed to think that we can learn something from darkness. He writes this, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. Maybe you're not ready to rejoice in your sufferings, but maybe you need to hear today that God is for you, 
that he sees you, that he has not abandoned you, that the life circumstances that you're navigating through have the potential to develop in you a person of great stability and great confidence in a loving God. When we suffer, we can persevere. And Paul assures us, though we may not like it, suffering can produce character and character hope. Of course, I want to say transformation looks different for every one of us. Our healing paths are different and require different things. What is right for one person is not necessarily what helps others. I'm glad that here at our church we have lots of ways for you to get connected and, and to find a step into community, into a group, all kinds of situations, all kinds of life stages. We have things for you that, would, that we believe would help you on the journey. But most of all, it, it's, it's going to take you taking a step. It's going to take you saying, I've, I'm not okay, and this is the situation, and I want to get some resources in this area, and we'd love to help you. Any one of our staff, you can email me if you need to. I would love to connect you with somebody who's either walked that journey or has a passion around helping people in whatever journey you find yourself in. But it takes courage to admit. It takes courage to lower our mask. And the church, the church should be the place that we're the most free to not try to pretend to be something that we're not. Because on the other side, there's freedom. There's connection. We have to be honest and face the darkness and not just face it, but challenge our view of it because God is still there and God is still listening. It's okay to not be okay, but can I challenge you and say it's not okay to stay there? And maybe you're in a season right now where even a tiny step would be a dramatic step for you to just say, I'm willing to admit this piece of me. I'm willing to let somebody else in so that I can get some help. God wants to accept you right where you are, but he doesn't want to leave us where he finds us. It's because we believe that transformation is possible and for every problem, every challenge, every pain that we face. In another place, Paul, again, challenging, he says, but he, Jesus, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my, my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, persecution, and difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. Paul, amazing. Well, finally, one last point. To move toward healing, embrace community. And I want to say this to those of you who, are, who, who have kind of isolated yourself during a season of pain, but I also want to say it to us as a church community. You are all part of the ambassadors of Jesus Christ in our community. Yes, you're connected to our church today, but you're going into communities and places and even being participating in, in a service like this, you are part of the healing community that Jesus had intended. And we need to help our brothers and sisters because someday we're going to need that. Acknowledging our pain, but coming into community is a place where in a dark season we can be healed because people can, can speak into us. Ann and I have some dear friends that are in their late 80s and uh, they have occasionally invited us to dinner, and it's usually last minute. And I love how they invite us. They say, can you come for dinner in 30 minutes, and you don't have to change your clothes? <laughs> Isn't that a great line? In other words, just come exactly as you are. We don't, you don't need to clean up for us. We don't care if you've been changing the oil or working in the yard. They mean, we just want you to come. It's a beautiful metaphor for a community of faith. We are comforted by God, not just for ourselves, but so that we can be a comfort to others. Healing happens in community, not isolation. John Ortberg wrote a great article in Christianity Today many years ago, and he says this, no one wants pain, not even long-time mature Christians who want to grow. We will always, always find ways to avoid pain. And the place to begin to help someone in a crisis is with simple humanity. When someone is in crisis, don't start teaching or explaining. Just be with. And he goes on to talk about how the Jewish custom of sitting with somebody who's mourning, it's called sitting sevens or sitting shiva in the Hebrew, but it, it just means to be present, to not say anything. In Job's case, his friends came around him and they, they actually are admirable. They sat for seven days in the dust because they could see that his pain was so severe. And at the end of that, they start to talk and they start to give Job all kinds of advice and they get in trouble over the years for that 
for that advice and for right, for good reasons. But, but their initial intent was to come and sit on the ground with a friend. Orper concluded and he said, in normal times, community blesses, but in crisis, community saves. We're called to carry each other's burdens. Mental and emotional health and mental and emotional challenges are extremely isolating. And the temptation is to turn inward. And we want to ask you appropriately to reach out and to get some help and to open up. If you're in a crisis right now, I want, I want so much for you to have some avenue and some way of connecting, some way of opening up and connecting with other people. I would love, as I said earlier, to connect you. Jesus Christ is the only one who delivers happily ever after. He's the only one who can. And of course, Jesus famously said, we all know this verse, right? In this world, it's possible you will have trouble. In this world, you will occasionally have trouble. No, he said it this way. He said, in this world, this world of beauty but of suffering, you will have trouble. But take courage, for I have overcome the world. This closing quote by Tim Keller, he says, Jesus Christ experienced darkness as his only friend so that in your darkness, you can know that Jesus is still your friend. He's there. Jesus was truly abandoned so that you will only feel abandoned, but you have never been abandoned. You can know that God is still there. He's not going to abandon you no matter what you have done wrong because Jesus has taken the penalty. If you've been crushed in spirit lately, I don't mean it was just a bad weekend, but I mean it's been, a, it's been a thing, or the future looks bleak, you might be wondering, is there anything that looks up? The opportunity to trust God in difficult situations is a huge opportunity right before you. The chance to model hope to a hope-needy world is growing. The potential to develop a faith that can withstand a storm is on the upswing. The whole, this holds true because things remain constant, these things. God remains in control. Grace triumphs over sin. Prayers are heard. Heaven's mercies are renewed each morning. The cross continues to stand as a symbol of sacrificial love. The tomb is empty. And the kingdom that Jesus promised is still advancing and he wants to advance into your life with hope and healing. The team and I were talking about how to close this service and one of the things we thought is we'll have a final a, a closing song but I thought during this song maybe your small act of courage and we've got time if you want to come from the balcony is, is to just come and kneel at the front. Not to say that I've got all these huge issues but maybe you just need to take a single step to say I'm in pain or I've got an issue or would you come on behalf of someone you love and care about and just, may, they may not be here. They may not be here for that very reason. But what if you came and what if we prayed together as a church and we, we sang this closing song as an acknowledgement, as a consecration. And I'd like to just invite you to come and kneel as the band begins to play and just offer it as an offering to the Lord. A chance to just take a single step in his direction in the midst of our challenging times. So just participate. And when you feel ready, you can come forward. In a moment, I'll come back up and we'll pray. And um, we'll ask you to stand and join with us. And you can stand, by the way, at any time if you want to be part of the choir here. So thanks. I'm sorry 
When I've just gone through the motions, I'm sorry. When I just sang another song, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I opened up my heart to you. Oh, I'm caught up in your praises. I just want to see extend a hand forward just to symbolize for those that are kneeling that we're with them. Father, I just want to come before you and we are all fellow journeyers in this, this life and I know there, there are people at this altar that are, that are suffering and I know, Father, that you're a God that has come close to those who suffer. You're a God who wants to remove the ashes and, and give us a crown of beauty and morning and give us the oil of gladness and a garment of praise for a spirit of despair. Father, thank you for Jesus who went before us and, and knows us and knows what it sounds like when people cry out because he too cried out. Father, would you bring, bring wisdom in the situations here that are needed? Bring healing, physical healing, emotional healing for those that are bringing that today. For those with this hole of grief, I pray, Father, that only by your spirit and your comfort, by the community of friends and people, that they might begin to feel the warmth of your, of your very real presence. Father, in all these things, I ask that your spirit would redeem and restore us, not only those here, but also all of us. Life is going to throw curveballs at us all day long, and we just ask that we might become people of character as we continually come to you because we trust you, and to whom else should we go? For only you have the words of eternal life. So we love you, Father. We thank you. We praise you. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you at the altar, you're welcome to stay. Would you join us in singing as a consecration? I'd like to, then I'd like to come up and just dismiss you, okay? So join us, and let's sing together. you don't know me anything and more than anything that you can do I just want you oh, I just want you and nothing else and nothing else Nothing else will do
really true, isn't it? All of us have gone other places to find hope and relief, but there's only, there's only one place to go. Nothing else will do. So my friends and family and loved ones, I, I just urge you this week to go with the knowledge that God has gone with you and gone before you. And I pray that the God of all hope will fill you with joy and peace so that you might overflow with hope in the power of the Spirit. So go, friends. You're welcome to come back on Wednesday. Please come back in the next few weeks. It's going to be fun. It's glad to have you today, okay? Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>